Uh, regional update, since this is the one at center point, is when we talk about system entry. Remember, early system entry for trauma, for trauma, strokes, and STEMIs. Uh, with the overcrowding we have in our ERs right now, the, due to COVID, uh, it's pretty important that you get these folks put in the system before you leave the scene, so you know where you can go, where there's a place to go for these folks. Okay. We've talked in the past about uh, with STEMI entry. If the EKG machine says STEMI, the patient fits it. You call TCC, they get put in the STEMI system. If the patient has clinically signs of ACS, but the cardiac monitor does not say STEMI, you can still enter that person into the STEMI system. And the way you do that is you call TCC. You tell me you have a patient that has a non-diagnostic 12 lead. They will, you determine which uh, hospital, which cath available hospital you want to go to. They will send you to that hospital by radio or phone. They will send that EKG to that hospital. You will talk to a physician at that hospital, discuss the case. They will look at that 12 lead. If they agree with you that 12 lead is a STEMI, the patient goes in the system, you go to that hospital. If you talk to that hospital, talk to that doc, they look at the 12 lead, they say, hey, I'm not sure, I'm not convinced. OK, they are not put in a STEMI system, but they should still go to that STEMI hospital because you're concerned and that doc looks at that 12 lead. OK, so if you have a 12 lead in a patient, you think it's having a STEMI, talk to TCC, they'll know the machine does not say it. They will connect you to that hospital, work with you. All right? Remember, this should be quick, be professional. And if they do not, uh, the doctors not think it's a uh, STEMI like you do, not a big deal. You go to the hospital where that doc saw that 12 lead. OK. Perfect. Um, don't forget, we uh, the state funded the care system last year. COVID kind of hosed us for a while, but uh, it's about time to get back involved with that. It's the cardiac arrest registry. We're also moving the STEMI system statewide, so get ready for that. <clears throat> if you need medical direction in the Birmingham region, uh, reach out to me. I'll be happy to help you. If you don't like me, no offense, I'll find somebody for you. But you need somebody that's an active ER physician that's keeping up to date with the protocols, the things that are changing. If you do not have one of those, reach out to me. We'll find somebody for you. And don't forget, we also have the YouTube uh, channel now. You get Con Ed uh, at least until the end of the cycle 2021, this March. Uh, National Register says you can watch videos online, take the tests, and that counts. You don't have to do live in person training for National Registry Renewal because of COVID. Uh, so check out our YouTube channel. Don't forget the fire college is sponsoring us. We're going to Foley on the 28th, okay? Uh, and the other big thing I gotta talk about is remember the things out there besides COVID. There's still trauma, there's still strokes out there, there's still cardiac arrest. We still gotta do the things we did before COVID. Just now we have COVID, unfortunately. All right, so COVID vaccines. Uh, there are several hospitals that are offering this EMS now. UAB had 1,500 doses. I'm not sure we got close to giving those out. I know Brookwood has some now. Shelby Baptist in the Brims region has those. Uh, there are a lot of questions about the COVID vaccines. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, I, I'm getting the vaccine. So uh, somebody mentioned to me, uh, what about the safety of these things? Uh, I think that all of us have put worse things in our body probably uh, than a vaccine. Uh, I also think uh, with COVID, you're talking about, you're gonna get COVID at some point, in my opinion, or you're gonna get the vaccine or you can get both. Most people that get COVID do fairly well. There is a subset of people that do not do well. Um, so people are dying from COVID. COVID causes severe respiratory problems. If you have comorbid health problems, if you're obese, you're diabetic, if you're older, those folks do very poor with that. People who get admitted to the hospital have a very high mortality rate. I would say these are my numbers, not epidemiological numbers. 10 to 12 percent chance of having a bad outcome if you're admitted to the hospital for COVID. Uh, so I would advise we get the vaccine, guys. Um, inappropriate humor, you know what that movie is? <laughs> yes, right. So I watched this before I got my vaccine. All right. And I did fine. Uh, but again, I would recommend the vaccine. Uh, it's a risk to benefit. Um, uh, COVID is real. COVID is bad. People have bad outcomes. If the vaccine is available to you, I would recommend taking it. Reach out if you got questions. Though, okay. The other thing I want to talk about is wall times. Remember, everybody be nice. Uh, everybody's busy. The ERs are stretched. EMS is stretched. So for my ER colleagues watching, remember the goal is to get EMS into the department and get them back out in the street. Okay. Uh, even if you don't have beds, the patient is better off sitting in a chair in our ERs. All right, and then sitting in the community with nobody around them. All right, we got to get our EMS colleagues back out in the field. 
All right, uh, for the EMS folks, if ERs are giving you a tough time, remember they're having a rough day as well. Be nice, be polite, but we gotta get you guys off the wall. Oh, Foley's coming up. I think February tentatively is Springville. Is that right, Chief? Yes, no, maybe, maybe Springville. In March, we're going somewhere up in North Alabama for the last Wednesday of the month. The, uh, a lot of folks are going to VLS transports. Uh, there's a big shortage of medics right now, especially with those on leave for being ill. Uh, remember, the scope of practice for EMT is pretty broad. So this is the foundational training we all get. There are a lot of things that our EMT should be able to do. So if you're working with the EMT as a medic, please help uh, the tour these people. Get them up to speed. Things that are pre in exam taking, vital signs. Other things we talk about, remember the state's approved blind insertion devices, so they can do kings, they can do eye gels. Simple airway maneuvers make a big difference when you're ventilating some way, someone. The king is out there. Uh, this is an older, well, it's still relatively new, but in my opinion, an older airway device. Double balloon, I'm not a big fan of the king, but if you're a new EMT or basic EMTs, we used to say, uh, you're allowed to use these in our state now. Do not use them unless you've been trained. So get with the training officer, get with your medical director, make sure they're good with this. Okay. Uh, I potentially, I personally prefer the eye gel. I think it's a little bit easier. There's no balloon there. This is pretty redneck proof. You gently lubricate the end of this, place it into the mouth hole, and it should ventilate pretty well. If you're using capnography, which you should be using if you place eye gels or kings, you should get away from capnography. If you just have the litmus paper test, the easy cap, it should change as well. We'll see. Super simple to use. You can lubricate with KY jelly. In reality, most folks that are unresponsive, you need to help ventilate. We're going to have secretions in the mouth. It probably slides in without lubrication. You see a double kind of give, it gave it in the back of the posterior pharynx, and then right when it get over the glottic opening. Super easy to use, limited risk, potential benefit. Once you place these things, wait for them capnography and ventilate. Chest should move, patients should in theory get better. Easy stuff. And remember capnography. For our medics out there, if you got some time on your shift during the day, pull this thing out, talk to it with your base or your EMTs, sorry, I shouldn't be saying basic, and then understand how these things work. In short, if you have perfusion and ventilation, blood supply, air going in, air going out, you should see a waveform that tells you that tube is in the right hole and you're ventilating your patient. All right, first case, we got a 53-year-old male uh, with abdominal pain, some nausea and vomiting. So what do we do? We get on scene. First crew should go ahead and kind of do a quick scene survey, make sure it's safe. Look at the surrounding, what's going on. We teach our docs, our residents that we go in a room, we get a physical talk, we get a history from a patient, we talk to them. After we do the history, we do a physical exam, then we formulate a plan and interact with the patient. That's not how we do it in the pre-hospital world, not how we do it in the ER. In reality, I'm getting my history as I'm doing my exam and I'm doing my interventions at the same time. So I'm gonna walk in, I'm going to put hand on the guy's pulse. Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it palpable? Is he warm? Is he diaphoretic? Is he cold? What's going on as I'm getting my history? OK, so this guy is alert. He's a little bit pale. His belly is tender to palpation, kind of round and distended. OK, he's got a fast radial pulse. His skin is still warm and dry. As far as history concerns, I start asking questions like when did the start? What kind of significant health problems do you have? Tells me he has a history of ulcers. He says he drinks a lot, smokes a little weed, a little bit of tobacco. What kind of medicines do you take? Like anybody in Alabama, he takes a blue pill, a white pill, a green pill. Nobody knows their medicines, right? So I ask important things like ever had a heart attack or stroke? If they say yes to that, I know they're hot for a bad outcome. I also know that they're probably on some kind of blood thinner, correct? Aspirin, Plavix, Coumadin, Xeralto. Say, are you a diabetic? If they say yes, I say, do you take shots or pills? Keep it simple. If they take shots, they're probably a type one, higher risk for bad outcomes, bad disease process. If they take pills, they may be okay, all right? So those are the important questions I start thinking about with this guy right here, okay? I want to figure out what history matters, okay? And by asking appropriate history questions, it kind of puts them in a box, sick or not sick, 
and it tells you which way to go down as far as determining how quickly to manage the guy. So this guy says he drinks some alcohol. So you think with alcohol use, you can get big time liver disease, you can get gastritis, you can get pancreatitis. Chronic alcohol use also leads to a failed pancreas, you get diabetes. So I can kind of give you an idea of what's going on as far as his abdominal pain and nausea vomiting, okay? You also think he says he drinks a lot, maybe he's drunk now, that's the problem. Maybe there's really nothing else going on. Folks that smoke are at increased risk of having abdominal aneurysms. Those things can rupture and people can have bad outcomes from that. Most of the time, they're not upright talking to you, though. Other questions I think about are surgical histories, okay? You ever had surgery in the belly and that you're more prone to having uh, uh, bowel obstructions and things like that? And then obviously, abdominal exam is very important to determine what's going on there. So I'm laying hands on his belly as I'm talking to him. I'm trying to distract him as I palpate pretty hard. And I'm looking at four quadrants, right? So right lower quadrant, we're always kind of thinking appendix issues, right? Left lower quadrant in males, I'm thinking if they're tender there, you think about diverticulitis, maybe a perforation, all right? You're also looking for signs of trauma, okay? Right upper quadrant, I'm thinking pain up there is liver related or maybe gallbladder related. Left upper quadrant, quadrant, I'm thinking more pancreatitis or maybe gastritis, maybe some kind of peptic ulcer disease, gives you a lot of information. You can also think about abdominal exam. If the belly, belly is pretty uh, firm, okay, and doesn't move a lot, you think is that due to the fact that they've now got a perforated viscous and they got free air in the belly? Or do they have some kind of ascites, a lot of fluid in the belly? So it doesn't take long to get this history. I can do all this, this history and this exam in a matter of a minute on this guy, okay? And then when you talk about uh, people with belly pain and vomiting, you want to have them to kind of describe it. You know, do they have nausea, vomiting, is there any kind of diarrhea, any major GI complaints or changes? So when I talk about vomiting, I ask, you know, are you throwing up bright red blood? Is it black blood? What does it look like? Okay. Uh, so classically, we say if somebody has bilious green uh, kind of vomit, you think maybe a bowel obstruction, things are backing up to throwing that up there. But bright red blood, Vomitus is pretty bad. That tells you there's some kind of leak in the upper GI system that's getting bright red blood out there, okay? In regards, the other opposite end is the black blood, right? The digested stuff. That tells you it's probably been sitting in the stomach for a while, digested, so they're having some kind of bleeding, but it's maybe not arterial, not or, uh, super acute. Does that make sense? You like vomit? I like vomit. One of my favorite fluids in the world. Cool. So I got lots of vomit pictures. <laughs> I like vomit. So, so we talked about this uh, back in November. We talked about lower GI bleeds, bright red blood rectum, uh, diverticular bleeds, things like that. So we're going to talk about a couple of upper GI bleeds for a few minutes. So when you talk about upper GI bleeds, when you think about bright red versus black, bright red vomitus makes you think of what? Anybody got an idea what you think about with that? Varices, yeah, esophageal varices. So you got some kind of high pressure system causing bright red arterial venous bleeding. Super concerning. These guys are in bad shape. These guys can have a bad outcome pretty quick, right? Versus this black stuff, which is blood that's been kind of sitting or pooling in the stomach or the upper intestine that they vomit out. Still very dangerous. People can die from this pretty quick, but the bright red aggressive bleeding is more concerning, right? So we talked about lower GI bleeds last time. So when you think about upper GI bleeds, there's hematoemesis, which is bright red blood coming out of the mouth hole, okay? You got your coffee ground stuff, which is digested blood, usually staying up in the gastrum, in the stomach, okay? Like you see in the bottom right there. And if you're talking about stuff coming out the bottom, out the rectum, you know, last time we talked about bright red blood coming out of the rectum, that's diverticular, it's arterial bleeding from the lower GI tract. If you got digested blood coming out your backside, out your bottom, it means it's probably an upper GI bleed that's gone through the whole GI tract, it's been digested, okay, and you got that color change, okay. So you can kind of tell whether it's an upper or lower, but then sometimes it's pretty tough, okay. So we got a guy that's throwing up bright red blood, he's a little tachycardic, okay, and he's got abdominal pain, so it kind of falls in the midline, what's going on with him. But with the history of alcohol disease, things like that, I'm gonna start thinking liver problems, I'm thinking worst case scenario, which is esophageal varices, these folks can bleed out and die pretty quick on you. All right, so back to the case. 53-year-old male, we're getting our vitals. He's tachycardic. First blood pressure is a little bit soft. He's breathing fast. He's satin fine. 
Glucose is 201, and remember the way I kind of look at glucose is if it says low, we know how to fix it, right? They get glucose. If it says high, we think about DKA or hyperosmolar. Everything in between is kind of a meh. So we know he has diabetes or his body is stressed, but not super scary. And then we're working for an agency that actually has a little extra money, and we have waveform capnography by nasal cannula. They got an entitled CO2 of 20 to 24. So that kind of tells you that he's breathing fast, but he's not hypoxic. So this is not a respiratory. He's a little acidotic. So we know the guy's pretty ill, right? His belly is tender, is distended, maybe feel a fluid wave. If he's got ascites, he's probably got varices, right? There's more vomit. I'm not sure that came back up. All right. So liver disease is the 13th leading cause of death, or actually the 12th leading cause of death. All right. You can probably move some of this stuff up. Influenza and pneumonia is going up because of COVID, right? But liver disease is pretty bad, causes a lot of things, all right? You like number 13? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you for smiling. It's a tough crowd this morning. All right, so uh, things that cause liver problems, okay? Uh, chronic issues will be hep C, all right? Alcohol, chronic alcohol use, other drugs, Tylenol, uh, primary bilir, uh, sclerosing, uh, PBS. What is that? So help me out. Primary biliary. Is that what it is? It's the primary biliary. Uh, yeah. PBS. PBS. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. Public TV. That's what it is. TV. It's public oh, TV. All right. I think I got my initials wrong. So forget that one, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and then. Uh, Fatty liver from diabetes, poor diet, obesity. Acute things that cause liver failure, obviously Tylenol can cause it. Tylenol is a very horrible drug to die from with an overdose. Other drugs can cause this out there, obviously trauma, liver, uh, mets, uh, folks who have cancer in the GI tract, all the blood flow that goes from the GI tract ends up in the liver. If you have colon cancer, one of the biggest places it mets to is the liver, and you get liver failure pretty bad. And then acute fatty liver, sort of like with the NASH. So lots of things cause it. Our dude that we were talking about is a big alcoholic. Alcohol is part of the cause of his issue, okay? So quick anatomy review. When you think about blood supply to the liver, the liver gets blood from the aorta, like everybody else does. It gets arterial blood. But then everything from the stomach, from the spleen, excuse me, from the stomach, from the colon, all that returns back to the liver as well. So it's got almost like a dual blood supply. So lots of blood flow through there. The way the liver works is it's got <clears throat> the functional part of it here. Blood comes back from the gut, all right? Crosses through and then back out into the venous system, all right? The arterial blood comes through here, feeds the liver, but in short, the liver filters everything. It pulls proteins out of the things that you eat. It uses that to build things for your body, help build muscle. It makes uh, clotting factors. It makes protein to stay in your serum. It does lots of things. When you take in toxins into your body, such as alcohol, that also gets into your liver and it damages these cells. These cells get hard and thick, you get limited blood supply through here, blood flow backs up, the liver doesn't work well, and you get lots of problems. So a nice normal liver is nice and smooth, very pretty. With cirrhosis, it gets hard and swollen. And obviously, cancer blocks off those things. Liver does a lot of work. If you have chronic liver disease, chronic alcoholics, they get anemic. So they have low blood volume at baseline because they can't make the blood, right? They don't make the proteins that cause blood to clot. So they increase the risk of bleeding. They bruise easily. Lots of big issues if you have alcohol, chronic alcohol use. And again, this is where you see the blood supply. So blood from the stomach goes back to the liver, from the colon, from the intestine, everything goes back to the liver. If this liver gets nice and hard, and those cells put extra pressure. These vessels get engorged. You get a lot of swelling there. OK, you can come in. You get what's called portal hypertension, all right? So these vessels get really big. You got vessels that run up into the stomach. They get engorged. You get vessels that run up into the esophagus. They get really engorged with fluid because they cannot get back into the liver. 
And as these vessels get engorged, they're more prone to burst and tear. The ones in the esophagus, if they rupture, they're called esophageal varices. You get really high volume, high pressure bleeding, almost arterial in nature because of the backflow and the pressure on this. You can do the same thing in the gut. You can get bleeding to your stomach as well. All right. Other problem with this <clears throat> is because all this fluid is backed up into the venous system in the gut, you get a backflow, uh, decreased protein uh, uh, in, the, in the blood, and you get extra fluid shifting, and they get ascites. So they get a lot of fluid in the belly. Lots of fluid in the belly. The belly gets distended. They're not fat. They just have fluid in the belly. The problem with this is they get dehydrated pretty quick with this. They can be tachycardic and hypotensive at baseline. All right. The other problem with this is if you have all this extra fluid around the colon and the colon has, you know, little bit of crap in it, right? There's a big risk of that kind of cross contaminating and them getting infected. So folks with liver disease, very prone to having abdominal infections, getting sepsis, having issues with that. These are just some photos for you guys that are doing ultrasounds in the field or comfortable looking at those. This is an ultrasound looking in at the belly. This is the skin. This is bowel. All this black stuff is fluid. If this was a trauma patient that came in that was in a car wreck and is now hypotensive and altered, not doing ultrasound on him, and I saw this free fluid, I would say, okay, he's got blood in his belly. He goes to the OR, okay? If he's a cirrhotic with a belly that looks like that, and I throw the ultrasound probe on there, I say it's probably just a CITES, but I can check it. I put a needle in there, pull that fluid off. If it's nice and yellow, it's acidic. If it's bloody, it's blood. And you can figure out what's going on. These are varices. So this is a picture of an endoscope. So we take a scope, put it down the mouth hole into the esophagus. And we're looking, these are big vessels here. that are big and engorged. So that's blood under there. So if one of those tear, that's when you'll see them vomiting and throwing that blood up and it's bright red, pretty aggressive. Sometimes these just tear a little bit and you get leakage and that blood runs down to the stomach. It sits there for a while, they digest it, and they may vomit up black stuff, so it's hard to tell. But bright red blood, emesis, is very concerning for esophageal varices. The way we manage this uh, in game is we put an endoscope in there and we band them. So we find where it's bleeding and either burn it with a little cartery or put a band around it to tie it off. But you can imagine if they're actively bleeding, we put a scope down there, it's pretty hard to see. Okay, pretty hard to get done. The other things we can do, we can use what's called a Blakemore tube. This is pretty gruesome, but it's basically a tube that goes into the mouth. It's got two balloons. It looks like a big balloon and almost like one of those blow up animal balloons, like a hot dog, right? So this goes in, we inflate this cuff and it puts pressure, occludes the vessels in the esophagus. <clears throat> we inflate this and it does the belly. So really tube goes in, we inflate this, we cinch it back real tight. So this goes against the sphincter layer. Then we inflate this portion and we hope we're occluding the vessel that's bleeding out pretty good. Sometimes we put ice water down in here to help constrict. Uh, but this is a last ditch effort. If somebody has bare seal bleeding, it's going to be a bad day for them. Obviously, they get airway management early on. It's tough to do this to somebody that's awake. And the other problem is they're vomiting so much blood, you got to get an airway on these folks. They obviously get blood products. They get two we talked about. And then there's a drug out there called octreotide or uh, somatostatin. This is a drug that causes uh, uh, gastric vessels to kind of constrict and we can give this medicine in the hopes that these vessels kind of constrict a little bit and then we can use PPIs or proton pump inhibitors and we'll talk about those in a few minutes we'll talk about gastric bleeding but esophageal varices are very bad if somebody has an active bleed the mortality rate is probably 50 percent very bad day for these people things we can do surgically to fix them is we can go in there and do a splenal renal shunt. So the surgeon goes in, they put a tube between the portal vein and the spleen, and it takes some of the pressure off these vessels. It gives it a way to kind of get the blood supply going around again. They can do a TIPS procedure, which basically they take a, a graft and make a bypass between the portal vein 
in the vena cava, vena cava. And the purpose of that is to take the pressure off the backflow so you don't get esophageal varices because people die from those pretty bad. Semi inappropriate humor. You know, our tough crowd today. So uh, back to the case. So this guy uh, has got bright red blood coming out of his mouth. He's pale. He's got a distended belly. He's tachycardic. OK, hypotensive. So this guy is critically ill. You recognize this. This guy should be moving toward the hospital almost like a trauma patient, right? So we've got our vital signs. We've got our history. I'm starting IV access. I'm picking him up and I'm moving toward the hospital. So let's say this guy, instead of having the bright red blood coming out of his mouth, he has this gastric, this dark stuff, the digested stuff. I really can't rule out esophageal varices. He could have a slow bleed that's going to his gut. All right. He can have other things too. So you can have gastritis, issues like that. So folks who drink alcohol, alcohol irritates the lining of the stomach, and you get these big ulcers in here. These ulcers run across little vessels inside the gut, and you can get bleeding in there. So you get big ulcer formation, whether it be in the gastrum or in the first part of the, co uh, the uh, small intestine. Same thing. Alcohol is a big irritant. Non-steroidals, aspirin, goody powders, Motrin, Aleve, Mobic, those kind of drugs do the same thing. They tear up that gastric lining and cause problems with that. The way we treat these people long term is we limit alcohol, limit these NSAIDs if you have a gastric ulcer. We can give you what's called a proton pump inhibitor or a PPI. So that's like your Prilosec that you see at the drugstore at Walmart. Protonix is another one. And what those things do is they decrease the production of this acid that floats around so it doesn't irritate your stomach as much. We can also use histamine blockers, so Pepsid or Zantac, and it decreases the amount of uh, gas, I mean, uh, acid the stomach makes. Long-term irritation leads to erosions in the stomach. This is another endoscope, okay? And this is an ulcer in the stomach right here. And you can tell if there was a vessel running under this, when that erosion went through that vessel, you would get some bleeding, all right? The big problem with all these GI bleeds is you just can't see how much they're bleeding because it can be hidden in the GI tract. <clears throat> the other problem with that is it's hard to put direct pressure on this. So there's a big risk for these people to bleed out. So you got to recognize that they're sick. <clears throat> you got to recognize their risk factors. You got to get them to definitive care, okay? And this is melanin. This will be dark black purple poop. Is blood that's been digested is indicative that somebody's got an upper GI bleed versus the bright red blood per rectum we talked about back in November, which is a lower GI bleed. Enough vomit pictures? Oh, man. All right. So, treatment for these folks is we got to recognize they're ill. So, we recognize that GI bleeds kill people, big mortality risk for these folks. We got to recognize the risk factors, right? So, alcoholics, folks who uh, have liver disease, big risk for having esophageal varices and ascites. They can have gastri uh, uh, gastritis. So upper GI bleeds are very common in these folks. They're tough to manage if they're acutely bleeding and decompensating. So recognize they're sick, early IV access, early transport, okay? We can also talk about TXA. So TXA is approved uh, uh, for use by uh, EMS in our state. It's category A for traumatic hemorrhagic shock. It's category B for any other use, all right? But TXA is a pretty reasonable drug to use on folks who are bleeding, right? So remember, we've talked about in the past, the way TXA works is if your body has an injury, has a wound, it sends cells there, it clots that spot off. And then a few minutes later, the cells kind of go back and determine, hey, do we need to keep this clot? Or can I use the cells, the proteins that I clotted this off with somewhere else? So it kind of degrades the clot. If it starts bleeding again, it rebuilds it. TXA stops that. TXA tells your body, if you clot something off, leave that clot in place, don't jack with it, okay? That's the redneck interpretation. So TXA is pretty reasonable to use in those folks. There were, 
I think I think it would be within reason, yes, sir. If you got somebody who's unstable and active bleeding and you tell me that story, I'm gonna tell you to give TXA. There was a study that came out a couple of years ago. I think it was called either HALT or HALTED. You can Google that if interested that kind of looked at long-term effects of TXA. Did it help or hurt people? And the overall response in that study was there was no difference in care whether you gave somebody TXA or not with the GI bleed. Um, however, if you think about it from a, from a rational approach, if somebody's having an acute bleed, it is reasonable to do that. OK, so uh, limited risk, potential benefit. I think if I had a guy that was throwing up bright red blood as I'm moving to the hospital, I'm going to lie on bed control. Hey, 53 old male, known liver disease. He's got bright red blood uh, emesis. He's hypotensive with tachycardia. I'm going to give him some TXA. Is that fine? And any reasonable ER doc should say, sure, do it. And remember, when you call for med control orders, short and sweet, because we're ER docs, we get bored if you talk too long. Um, and then tell us what you want to do. And we usually approve that. So quick fluid bolus if he's tachycardic. I want to give him more than 20 cc's per kilo. I want to give him more than like a liter or two of fluid because we kind of wash out those clotting factors. And if he's an alcoholic with liver disease, we're going to have limited clotting factors as well. And then let us know at the hospital what's going on. Because if I got a guy throwing up blood <clears throat> who's hypotensive, okay, and tachycardic, when he gets to the ER with me, I'm going to intubate that guy right off the bat. So that way I can control his airway. And now I'll get a scope down or a Blakemore tube or something else to control the bleeding. So it gives me a few minutes to get ready, get prepared to manage these folks. Hey, Doc. Yes, sir. So we got a, a question from online. Uh, this is from one of our uh, nurses. Said had a similar case, uh, the freestanding, uh, about 2,500 milliliters of bright red vomit for 30 seconds. Uh, soft BP. This is a patient who had, had chronic episodes with varices, including previous bandings and uh, blade more placement on the last admission. And the question is, can Dr. Ferguson maybe touch on patients that deal with this chronically and how they may not respond as we would assume? Yeah, so you think about if you had the varices, like we looked at the picture earlier, you can have lots of spots where you get banded. Somewhere back into there. So, so if you have varices, right, and this you get a TIPS procedure or a splenal renal shunt, you're going to continue to have that backflow, that pressure that makes these vessels get bigger. So you can come in, have a bleed. I can find, we can find the bleed. We can ban that bleed, knock that off. All right. Well, that doesn't mean that one of these aren't going to bleed in the future. So end game for these folks is liver transplant versus a TIPS procedure or a splenal renal shunt to make this backflow better. Sometimes we'll use some pretty aggressive somatostatin or artriotide to keep these constricted. Uh, and these folks probably will always have a little bit of a leakage where these vessels leak and go into the gut and have a slow drip and have to come in and get blood transfusion sometimes. The problem again is when these things do rupture acutely, you can have some pretty massive bleeding. Somebody with a history of variceal bleeding that tells me they threw up a liter and a half of blood they tell me they've been had a blight more in them before. That person will be very aggressive in the management with those guys. So that person is going to get early IV access, aggressive fluid response, resuscitation. They're going to get early IV octreotide. I'm probably going to intubate them early in preparation for them to decompensate. Those folks are very sick. But long-term care for those guys is they got to get a TIPS procedure to bomb time to get a liver transplant. If you're at that point, you're in a bad spot. The other thing to think about folks with liver disease, are almost like folks that take Xeralto or Coumadin because the liver makes all those clotting factors. If your liver's not working and you got varices, that means you don't have clotting factors. So they're really uh, anticoagulated naturally because the liver's not working. So some people talk about giving them factor eight, like you would a hemophiliac to make them not bleed as much. But those folks are very scary. And that's somebody also, if they came in and they said they were vomiting blood, but they look relatively okay now, history of varices, <clears throat> and they were vomiting. I would never put an NG tube in them, a gastric tube in them, and why is that? Yeah, yeah, don't poke the bear, right? If I start putting things in here, I can rupture that, and that can kill them. So avoid that at all possible. If I intubated them, I'm probably not gonna put a gastric tube, tube in them either, because I could rupture it and make it worse. 
and most folks that I intubate in the ER I do put a gastric tube in just for airway management. Hopefully that answered the question, kinda. Let's scroll through our vomit pictures, which I like. So we kind of talked about treatment. So aggressive airway management is number one, so we can figure out what's going on. And then PCC sometimes, that's just replaces clotting factors on these people. Sometimes we give them vitamin K, just like you would for Coumadin. Obviously fresh frozen plasma because it has clotting factors. Platelets are reasonable as well for those folks. If they're on something that jacks up platelets, like an aspirin or a Plavix, definitely get it. Endoscopy by a GI surgeon. Surgery, if I think it's a gastritis and an ulcer, so those, those things bleed and they perforate, a surgeon can help with that. Surgeon cannot help with the varices though, right? But if it's gastric, like a bag of ulcer and a perf, you can do that. Sometimes you can get lucky and do a CAT scan, get a CT angio, and they can still go in and embolize, so like we talked about with the diverticular bleeds. So these folks are super, super sick, make you uncomfortable. I'm getting my second vaccine tomorrow, so that's going to be me, except I'm not a cat. I'm just, but anyway, inappropriate humor. So uh, this was a guy that, uh, just a random case that uh, came into the ER, said he was minding his own business, and his, uh, and his wife stabbed him. So if you think about CAT scans, normally you look at them like the head of the patient is inside the wall here, the feet are coming out, and they're looking up. Well, you can tell guy's laying on his stomach. This is his back, right? That's his spine. So he had a knife sticking out going in. So he goes in the CAT scanner, he's laying on his stomach, right? But you can see knife goes in between the ribs. This is lung tissue. It punctured his lung. This black stuff is air. So on an x-ray, that black is air. On an ultrasound, black is fluid. So that's air. That's another cut of the CT. So if this is his spine, right there, right? What is this round dude right there? Aorta. So he's, what, less than an inch away from that knife touching his aorta. If it touches the aorta, what happens to him? He probably dies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he doesn't do well, right? So, uh, guy got very lucky. It just kind of punctured his lung, gave him a small pneumothorax. Yeah, but his wife got to the hospital and I said, what, what's going on? He said that uh, you stabbed him as I'm calling the police, right? <laughs> the knife is in him, so I was safe. She couldn't stab me with that knife. And she said that he was not minding his own business, or actually he was, but he was minding his business with some other woman. So that's why he got stabbed in the back. So the moral of that story is don't mind your own business, all right? Uh, take care of each other, get involved. Um, if you're not, if you're a medic and you're not teaching a class, ACLS or PALS, if you're not involved in some kind of con ed, it's time to do that. Uh, we got to share the knowledge that you guys have with each other. Our EMTs are doing a lot now, things that we didn't teach 20 years ago. They're doing assessment, airway management. They're talking about drugs, capnography at an EMT level, which is a one semester course. So help out your partners, help out our colleagues, train each other, get involved. Uh, a lot of good things coming in this region. A lot of things are changing. Uh, so get involved, we gotta grow, okay? Questions, comments, statements within reason. Any more vomit pictures for the first of the year before we go on? Great. All right, we'll take a five minute break and then we'll- Just a second, Doc. I did have one question come in via text. Yes, sir. Which was dosing for TXA for GI bleeds the same as it would be for trauma? It would be, it would be, yeah. Because the only time I'm gonna give TXA for a GI bleed is if they're unstable. So the dose will be the same thing. So it'll be category B, med control, 53 year old male, liver disease. He's got hematoemesis. His vitals are unstable. He's got an active GI bleed. I need orders for two grams of TXA now. They should say yes. If they don't, don't get mad. When you get to the hospital, discuss it with the doc. Like I said, there is one study out there, the HALT study that talks about TXA doesn't help anyone, but it also showed it did not hurt anyone. Um, TXA should be given within three hours of the beginning of someone's bleed. So somebody can have a GI bleed for a couple of days and now be unstable and TXA would not help. Uh, but if it started recently, TXA should help them. Yeah. 
So a follow-up question from the same person was on the um, airway management. Um, was this, if the patient's uh, able to be intubated, uh, is that the way to go? Or is a supraglottic airway just as good for an active no. upper GI bleed? No. So I think the only time you put a supraglottic airway in an active GI bleed is if they're dead and you're doing chest compressions and you got to get your airway stuff set up. They need an ET tube. It needs to be definitive. A tube you can get in there. The cuff's got to be up because they're going to continue to vomit, okay? And they're going to aspirate that blood and it's going to be a bloody mess. This is somebody that you want to do it right, though. So you don't want to do what we call a dirty RSI with just sedation. You want to give them a paralytic as well so they cannot actively vomit. So therefore, it stops all fluid moving up, right? So you sedate them, you paralyze them, you sit them up just a little bit, and you get them intubated. So this will be advanced practice paramedics. Um, I would not use a superglottic unless they code on you and you're getting that in until you get set up to get them intubated. Very good, thanks. So everybody, we're gonna take a few minute break. Um, the password for the attendance form for today's class is 2021-2021. Uh, and after here a few minutes, we're going to hear from Dr. Eversoll from UAB on seizures. So everybody uh, get up and stretch, get some coffee, and we'll be right back. All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, we're going to get started back with Dr. Ever Eversoll. He's going to be talking to us this afternoon about seizures. Everybody remember to fill out an attendance form to get credit for today's class. There's a link to the form in the chat box online. Um, if you don't have access to the chat box, if you're on your phone, you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated reply with a link to the attendance form. The password for today's form is 2021-2021. And take it away, Dr. Harrison. Hey, can you hear me? Uh, it's on delay, so we'll find out in a few. <laughs> Perfect. Well, let me know if anything changes. Um, so... When I was a medical student, I rotated through one of the military hospitals down in San Antonio and a guy came and gave us a lecture on pulmonary embolism. And it always stuck with me, I always remembered it because he said, I wanna do this lecture because two years ago I was on a flight and I had some difficulty breathing, I coughed up a little bit of blood and next thing I know I got diagnosed with pulmonary embolism. And this was my experience. And you know, that, that kind of captivated me from the very beginning because it was something that he could speak to and it really meant something to him, which is one of the reasons I wanted to do this lecture on seizures today. Um, so my five-year-old son, who was just a normal healthy kid, started having seizures actually last month. We wound up spending about 17 days in the children's hospital. Um, and that experience taught me a lot of things. It changed the way that I approach patients who are having seizures. Um, and you know, it's personal to me now. So I wanted to uh, I wanted to be able to take this and share it with you guys. Um, I've been in EMS now for about 18 years. Um, I bet I've seen somewhere in the ballpark of 500 seizures over the course of my career in EMS and my time in the emergency room. Um, I think that seizures are probably one of the top two or three scariest things that a bystander or family member can witness. Um, they're sudden, they're unexpected. Um, and for people not in healthcare, it can be really difficult to process in the moment what's going on or what's happening. Um, when my son Luke had his seizure, we were in our living room. I knew exactly what it was, but I could still feel that tunnel vision, you know, and that I, I felt that helplessness that we hate so much as first responders. Um, my wife actually works at the children's hospital and she couldn't get her fingers to push 911 on the buttons on the phone. I mean, she was just completely in shock. Um, so when this happens, not only do you have the patient to deal with, you're also going to have concerned bystanders and especially concerned family members um, who won't often always be the best historians in the moment. And they're going to want a bunch of answers and you're not going to have a lot of answers for them. So what you can do is kind of provide reassurance, let them firmly know what your treatment plan is gonna be, and then what to expect at the hospital. And that's, that's some of the things that I'm hoping to touch on, is by the time we get done with this, you'll be able to say, hey, listen, this is what I wanna do with them. You know, in the ambulance, here's how I'm gonna take care of them, and here's what you think, you know, here's what you're gonna to need to know when, uh, when you get to the hospital. 
disclaimer here. I am not a neurologist, and I apologize if there are any like neuro specialists listening. I'm about to bastardize your specialty and simplify it into a way that makes sense to me. Um, this is something that, you know, no kidding, we could talk about for hours. I mean, for eight hours, we could talk about seizures, and we could do that for days on end. Um, there's a lot to go over. I'm just going to explain this in the terms that make sense to me. Just an overview of the order in which we're going to go through this. Um, we'll hit epidemiology. We'll go over the definitions. Um, definitions is going to be a big thing because a lot of times just getting the words right really help convey what you mean and what the patient means. Um, we'll hit on a little bit of pathophys. We'll go through the seizure, seizure classification types. Uh, we'll do a little bit of history and physical. We'll go over some common seizure mimics and then we'll talk briefly about hospital management, what we'll do in the hospital. I'm hoping that you'll be able to take that information and tell the family um, or tell the bystander, whoever is taking care of this person, um, when you guys see them, hey, this is this is where we're headed. This is our direction. Um, so this is actually my son. This is a picture of him uh, taken in the hospital last month. Uh, one of the things that you're going to hear me say kind of over and over again in this lecture is the words EEG, um, the electroencephalogram, which is what they look at with the brain waves, actually the background here for this slide is what it looks like on the monitor. Um, and on what, what normal looks like is over here to the left side of the screen. And then you can see that the, the pattern becomes a little more erratic um, about where the Z is over to the right side of the screen. Um, this is the tool, one of the tools that they use to determine if the seizure is generalized, focal, and those are all things that we'll get into, but I wanted you guys to have a picture of this early on so that when I kept saying EEG, y'all had an idea of what this was. And this is just taken straight out of the protocol book. Um, this is just the treatment protocol for seizure. And we can sum this up, IV, O2 monitor, blood glucose, um, treatment is benzos and transport. Um, and this is what you do every single time. Um, my practice when I was on the truck a good bit was always to start an IV even if they weren't actively seizing because you didn't know if they were going to start seizing again and it's a heck of a lot easier to do that when they're in the postictal phase and not shaking and trying to fight you. Um, now this just says start an IV. Um, the ideal situation for this would be to start like an 18 or a 20 in the AC or higher and the reason for that is because a subset of these people are going to go on in the emergency room to need a contrasted CT scan. And we can't push contrast in anything less than a 20 gauge and anything further away from the central part of the body than the AC. So a 22 in the hand is not going to get the job done. If it's me or my family member and you have an opportunity to start, you know, one in the AC, I would prefer that you did that versus, you know, just going on and hit the hand. It's easy. Obviously, you get whatever the patient gives to you. If the only good vein they have is in their hand, take it. I get it. I know how it goes. But this is just an ideal situation, and it shows that you're a little bit more forward thinking about what could happen to them in the future. I think that's better for them. This is from the CDC website. Um, it just shows estimated seizure prevalence. Um, this is one of those things where um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of, of an interesting picture because it just says, hey, we think this is how many people have seizures in these states. And so it's all based on population. Obviously, the states that have more people are going to have more people who have seizures. So it doesn't tell us about the incidence number of people in that population who have seizures. Um, so obviously, the big states like California, Texas, Florida, there are more people there. There are more people there with seizures. There's like one person in Wyoming. I guess that person doesn't have seizures because it's white up there. Um, hey, Doc, so this is, um, this says epilepsy. So you think this is counting seizures of any cause or just any of that? That's a great point. So that's something that we'll get into either on the, the, the next slide or the next. We're going to talk specifically about what that means. This, what they're talking about here specifically is epilepsy. And we'll get into that. Um, I'm really glad you brought that up. That'll be a great segue into our next few slides here. Um, so 
basically, if you look at this map, it says that in Alabama, we think there are about 54,000 people that have active epilepsy. Um, again, it just shows the number of cases. There was a paper that was published in the journal Neurology. Um, this was pretty recent, August of 2020. It looked at the incidence of seizures and seizure mimics over a year and found the incidence to be 102 and 100,000 people. So that's the incidence, not the prevalence. Those are seizures, not epilepsy. So a little bit different terminology. Um, but if you if you take what they have published in this neurology paper, paper they're basically saying, that's 102 calls for seizure per 100,000 people in the population. So I went, um, I talked to some of the guys at Mobile Fire. They were able to do some data mining on their, their calls from the year of 2020. And that year they ran, they were dispatched to 734 calls where the primary dispatch complaint was seizure. That's a city of about 200,000 people. So if we look at the neurology paper and we say, hey, you know, it's 102 calls, for 100,000 people, and we plug that into Mobile, we should say, well, there should be somewhere around 200 calls for seizure. They ran 734 calls where the primary complaint was seizure. So that's 530 more than expected. All I'm saying is that the truth is gonna lie somewhere in between where those extremes are. Um, you're gonna see more than I think what's published here, this 102 per 100,000 in the Birmingham metro area, like in our region, that's uh, about 1.1 million people, so 1,100 calls for seizure, essentially. Um, that's the conservative estimate. So this is definitely going to be something that's going to be very prevalent in the population. And this is perfect. So we just said a couple of different words. We said seizure. We said epilepsy. I said seizure mimics. Um, so this is our opportunity to really hash out the semantics of what we're saying because this stuff does get used interchangeably. I'm guilty of that. I think everyone who's ever dealt with these patients is guilty of kind of using those words to mean different things. Um, seizure mimics are going to be something that we address in a completely different section, um, but we will talk about it. So the first thing we'll do is talk about just the definition of seizure. Um, it's a sudden uncontrolled electrical disturbance in the brain. It causes changes in your behavior, your movements or your feelings and in levels of consciousness. If you have two or more seizures or a tendency to have recurrent seizures, then you have epilepsy. Um, there are many different types of seizures which range in severity and presentation. And we'll talk about those in upcoming slides. Here's our epilepsy definition, which has recently in the last few years been revised. When I first learned about epilepsy, it was the first definition up here. It just said, you have epilepsy if you have at least two unprovoked seizures occurring more than 24 hours apart. What they've done is they've gone now and they've added this second part down here that says one unprovoked, blah, blah, blah. All that basically means is that if you have a seizure and you get evaluated by a neurologist, they can say, you know what, you're pretty likely to have another seizure. I'm diagnosing you with epilepsy. So I don't think you'll get into arguments with these people about the semantics of whether they have seizures or not. But just know that it is possible for someone to have one seizure and be very likely to have another. And a neurologist still says, yes, you have epilepsy. Um, and then it also says one of the other things to point out here is that it says you have to have two unprovoked seizures. That's the big thing, the provoked versus unprovoked. Unprovoked seizures by definition occur in the absence of any provocative causes or more than seven days after an acute injury or insult, such as a stroke or a brain hemorrhage. I know that when we spoke earlier, um, you said, hey, this person has a seizure and then, or they had a, they had a stroke and then later on they had a seizure. Um, and so there's a time frame where we're saying, hey, if you have a stroke, if you do get hit in the head with a hammer, if something happens and you have an injury and you do have a seizure, that seizure is a provoked seizure. If you have two seizures from that, we're not saying you have epilepsy. We expect that once that gets better, once the injury gets better, that that won't happen anymore. But you can be left with these residual injury patterns, a scar on the brain, um, or an area of infarct after a stroke that does leave you with these residual seizures, at that point, you would have epilepsy. That's the difference in provoked versus unprovoked. I appreciate that, um, 
clarification. I know a lot of the EMS uh, initial education textbooks define epilepsy as seizures of unknown etiology, which is a little bit different than what you described because the the etiology could be known um, and it, it's more about epilepsy is that we predict you will continue to have seizures. Correct. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah, that's absolutely perfect. And in 60% in, in of cases, we never find a cause. So in 60% of these seizures, we go, yep, you're having seizures. We don't know why you're having seizures. That's an epilepsy. We go, I don't, I don't know why this happened. Um, you know, we can talk about the battery of tests that you go through, but when we say, hey, um, you're having these, we don't know why you're having these. We assume that if they're generalized seizures, we assume that there is either a genetic component to it. So there is some genetic factor that we just don't have a test for because the field of genetics is still relatively young in terms of being able to test for every single thing. If it's a, uh, it, it could also be a metabolic derangement that we just haven't identified. So you may overproduce a hormone that would cause that that we just can't test for. If it's a focal seizure, which is a different type of seizure we'll talk about, and we don't have a cause, we just say there's probably a small scar on the brain from an injury, and it's just too small for us to see. Does that make sense? Um, a little bit of the pathophys for seizures. I feel like a lot of the neuro stuff is sort of like smoke and mirrors and a little bit of voodoo when they talk about seizures. Any of the brain stuff, it gets so complicated. So I'm going to try and present this in a way that, that I think about it uh, because it, it helps, it makes sense to me. Um, everyone, everybody in this room and everybody listening has some propensity to have a seizure. The term seizure threshold means that we all exist on a spectrum of susceptibility. Um, there are many different variables that affect where we are on the spectrum. Um, medications are medication non-compliance, genetic factors, um, electrolyte abnormalities, sleep state, um, infections, fevers, alcohol intake, um, you know, there's brain inflammation, brain injuries, stroke. Stroke is actually the most common cause of new onset seizure in people over 65 years old. Um, and then there's drugs. So either taking drugs or withdrawing from drugs, both of those things can so cause seizures. It's almost like a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, and then pregnancy. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. I mean, there's, there's, it's almost easier to say these are the things that don't cause seizures versus the things that do. Um, any and all of the things that we just talked about can push someone on the spectrum to the point where a seizure occurs. So seizures start with the excitation of a susceptible neuron or a group of susceptible neurons. This leads to a synchronous electrical discharge of larger and larger groups of connected neurons, like a ripple effect in a lake. Um, neurotransmitters also play a role. Just remember that neurotransmitters are just hormones and when they come into contact with a cell that has a receptor for that hormone, then it gives the cell instructions on what to do next. Not all cells have receptors for all hormones. What we're specifically talking about here are neurons. Um, those are our brain cells. They have receptors for glutamate and they have receptors um, called GABA receptors. Glutamate is the most common excitatory neurotransmitter. So if I were just to flood you with glutamate right now, you would have a seizure. Um, what this means is that when glutamate binds to the receptor on the cell wall of the neuron, it tells the cell to become more excited. And this occurs in the form of an electrical discharge of the neuron. Um, something to not get hung up on when we talk about this stuff. Glutamate is a hormone. GABA is a receptor. Glutamate binds to several different receptors on the cell wall. So like NMDA receptors, for example, I think those are kind of the most frequently talked about ones. Glutamate binds to those and it excites the cell. There are tons of different things that bind to GABA receptors and we'll talk about that. Um, it can be activated by alcohol, benzos, propofol. There is a huge list of things that can activate GABA receptors. Um, this means that when a GABA receptor is activated, it tells the cell essentially to simmer down and, and it inhibits discharge of that electrical impulse. 
Um, we don't always think pathophys, at least I don't when I'm treating patients, I don't like zoom into that cellular level. Um, because once we really identify the problem, we know what we need to do. And so we say this person is having a seizure, we need to give them benzos. The reason we need to give them benzos is because we need to activate that GABA receptor and try and get everything to get cooled back off. Does that make sense? Cool. Go ahead. So when, um, you mentioned that um, the hormone glut glutamate. Glutamate. Mm -hmm. So what? What? Where's? Do you happen to know where that's produced? Um. Yeah, I, I think they're all just produced. You know, I think all of those are neurotransmitters produced in the CNS. But I'm not sure if there's like a specific site. It's not a pituitary gland thing. Um, if that's what they're getting at. Um, Dr. Farr, do you have any insight? No, sir. Right, just sorry, head. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Somewhere in the brain? Yeah, that's what I said in the brain. Okay. Thanks for nothing. Yeah, no. Yeah. 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 All right, so when I was in EMS, I first learned about seizures, and I thought seizures were all just this like classic jerking movement. Um, and a neurologist would slap me across the face if I said that now, because there's a huge spectrum of um, seizures and the presentations vary so much, uh, which is why it's, you know, this subject is something that we could talk about for so long. Um, what we just said was that the definition of a seizure is a sudden uncontrolled electrical disturbance in the brain. And what that looks like is going to depend on what part of the brain is affected. And that's where we get our major divisions here into either partial or generalized seizures. If the whole brain is affected, we call that a generalized seizure. If only a part or a half of the brain is affected, we can call that a partial seizure. Um, so let's talk about the partial seizures first. Um, the way that I think about partial seizures is on a spectrum from bad to worse. So if you think of a simple partial seizure, at seizure as, um, you know, kind of the best case scenario, um, and just affects a small part of the brain, and then a complex partial would affect more of the brain, and then a partial with secondary generalization is essentially what it sounds like where it spreads and becomes a generalized seizure and affects the entire brain. Um, that partial with secondary generalization down there is actually the most common uh, type of seizure in adults. So that's the one that you are the most likely to see. Um, we will talk about the simple partial seizures first. So like we said, they just involve a small portion, a small group of neurons and a focal area of the brain. By definition, there is no impairment in consciousness and the person will remain aware in a simple partial seizure. Um, I remember running calls on people and, you know, these crazy family members are like, they're having a seizure, look at them. And I'm like, she's not having a seizure. She's talking to me. She's just like, this is not a seizure. And they're like, no, it's a seizure. And the patient's going, I'm having a seizure. And it's like, whatever, let's just take you to the hospital. Like, that sounds great. You know, your vitals are fine. We're just going to we're going to take you to someone who knows more about this than I do. So they're not wrong. Um, these are the kind of seizures that they're probably referring to. Um, the person may experience like an isolated motor impairment. They may just kind of turn their head or neck like this. Those are the most commonly seen things. Um, they can also experience like those uh, paresthesias, the pins and needles feelings. Um, some would present like that. They can also have changes in vision, auditory, visual, olfactory, gustatory hallucinations. Um, those have all been reported if focal seizures occur in the area of the brain that controls those functions. So if you have a focal seizure in the visual cortex of the brain, that can cause a visual hallucination. The same thing, a gustatory hallucination is like, I feel like I'm eating graham crackers right now, but there's nothing in my mouth. That's a gustatory hallucination, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, there've also been changes, if this affects your, your autonomic nervous system, um, you can have like sweating, tachycardia, 
um, diaphoresis, those type of symptoms, even goosebumps. So some of these partial seizures can just be like goosebumps. Um, so these are the ones that I was certainly suspect of, I guess, kind of before I knew more about it. Um, let's see if we can get this to work here. So, um, so this is my son and he initially had generalized seizures, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, they eventually localized and he had these simple partial seizures where he would remain aware, um, but he would experience a respiratory arrest. So he would just stop breathing. And one of the scary things is that this would happen in the middle of the night sometimes. And the only way that we would know that he was having a seizure was his sat alarm would go off. Um, will they be able to hear the audio on this? Probably not. Probably not. So in the, in the audio, um, you can actually hear the alarms going off in the background. I'm not sure you'll be able to hear it or not. Um, and then you'll hear me say, hey, bud, take a deep breath. And, you'll, and he can respond. He'll take a big, deep breath. And then he kind of comes out of it. And I say, where are you? And he says, we're at the doctor. So he's aware the entire time. He knows exactly what's going on. And the only tell for us, I mean, obviously, I was by his side the entire time. But if you see how his lip is curled up a little in the side of his face here, doesn't quite look symmetric. This was the only real tell that we had that anything like this was going on. And if he weren't hooked up to a monitor and that we knew that he had a respiratory arrest, he would just get hypoxic and, and possibly collapse. But these were things that we wound up having to bag him through occasionally. So let's see if we can hear it. I know we'll be able to see it. So you see his lip is just kind of drawn up a little. And I say, take a big breath. And he does. And now you can kind of see his face relax a little bit. He blinks, he kind of zones back in. And he says, we're at the doctor. So another thing to notice over here, he's aware, he can follow commands. There's no post period, no postictal period at all for him. Um, so when he's, when he's done with this event, he's back. Um, the only way that we knew, so this was actually localized on EEG to his right temporal lobe. Um, and so, you know, that's one of those things that would have absolutely driven me insane if we hadn't had a good reason for it happening, you know? Um, let's see. All right. So that was our simple partial seizure. Let's move on to complex. Um, the main differences between the simple and the complex partial seizures is that the complex seizures are associated with a loss of awareness and a subsequent postictal phase. Like we just said, when you saw Luke have that, he's aware, he can follow commands, no postictal phase. By definition, these people, when they have this partial complex seizure, this will look a little bit more like a generalized picture where they will have a postictal phase. Um, the common presentations for this are just lip smacking or tremors of the extremities. And when I say tremors, I mean tremors just kind of like a shaking as opposed to like the violent tonic clonic jerks of a bigger generalized seizure. Um, this may also just present as a simple confused state. Um, so complex partial seizures and generalized seizures have some similarities. They differ in that the generalized seizures involve both sides of the brain, whereas the complex seizures just spread and involve a hemisphere or half the side of the brain. They won't cross the corpus callosum and involve the entire cerebral cortex. Um, partial with secondary generalization. Again, this is the most common seizure type you're going to see in adults. Um, partial seizures with secondary generalization start out exactly the same. They start with a focal group and again, using that ripple effect in a lake, they're going to spread, but they're going to continue to spread across the entire brain cortex and basically diffusely involve the brain. Um, this by now, is a generalized seizure. So now we're in the world of generalized seizures. Let's see if we can get this to work here. Um, so this is a video. This is 
Um, this is exactly what we just talked about. This starts out as a simple partial seizure. And we said one of the most common presentations of a simple partial seizure is head turning. And so I want you guys to pay attention to the guy in the white. Um, it's going to start out, they're going to be washing the cars, and you're going to see that head turn. And that is the simple partial seizure. You then, he's going to basically still have his motor control. You're going to see him brace against the back of the ambulance, and then you're going to see it spread, and it's going to be a diffuse, generalized seizure. Another thing to watch, watch this guy. So these are, you know, these are all EMTs. These are all first responders. They see this stuff every day. But you remember how I said when this happened, I was, I was, just, I could feel the tunnel vision. Watch this guy. I know this guy. He's a great guy. He's spot on. He's a fantastic fireman and a fantastic EMT. Now you can see down at the bottom of the screen here, he's washing a brush out. So, Doc, this is at Rocky Ridge Fire Department, is that right? That's correct. All right, now you see that head turn? He still has motor control. He knows something is wrong. He's going to brace against the back of the ambulance. And now it's a generalized seizure. And he's going, hey, this guy, something's not right. And you can see how the whole body is stiff. He has some shakes. They're going to move him. They're going to put him in the recovery position. They had this guy at Grandview in like five minutes or something. Um, I mean, they, they moved on him. And so we see the, you see the jerking movements here. And now you're going to see him sternal rub the, the, the guy here. And there's going to be no response. Sternal rub, nothing. Another sternal rub and nothing. Which is pretty classic for the postictal phase. And so this was just a normal day. They were just out washing the trucks. This is something that, you know, guys at the station do one, two times a day. Right, Chief? <laughs> um, and it's just, there's no warning, you know? Um, and it, it becomes this thing where it's, it's almost hard to process. You're like, I, this guy's having a seizure. What is going on right now? Um, That guy gave me permission to share that video, uh, and I'm, I'm really glad that he did. He's a, another fantastic guy as well. Um, but that's a great segue into our generalized seizures. So, again, just to hammer it again, um, a generalized seizure by definition involves the entire cortex. Everything in the brain is firing. Um, now, once we get into that, there are multiple classifications, as you can see. Um, for our discussion, we're basically going to say, hey, there's absence seizures and then there's everything else. Um, in terms of nomenclature, absence seizures have been called petite mal seizures, and then we refer to everything else as grand mal seizures. Um, I think for our purposes and, and for the way that I think about it, I keep these two categories where they are. Um, instead of getting into the fine details of what differentiates all the grand mal seizures, uh, we're just going to simplify this by saying that like a tonic clonic seizure, which is what we just saw, um, that's sort of the prototypical grand mal seizure. Um, you know, whether their muscles are contracted or whether they have loss of muscle tone, none of that stuff really matters if they're having a generalized seizure. You're going to treat it the same way. Um, so let's dive into the grand mal seizures first, and then we'll come back to the petite mal seizures because there's a few special cases of grand mal that we're going to get into. Um, all these occur, all the generalized occur due to the rapid firing of the entire cortex again. With these, you're going to get various changes in muscle tone, and they're all associated with a postictal stage, just in contrast to the absent seizure, which is the entire cortex, but does not have uh, loss of muscle tone. Um, treatment for all this is benzos. I mean, that's pretty bread and butter stuff for all of us. 
So seizures are typically time limited events that don't require emergent intervention. You're going to get called. 911 gets called every time this happens, right? Um, but in reality, most of the time they're benign, like it's not an emergency. Um, however, there are exceptions to that. If the seizure doesn't stop, then we get into the world of status. And, and that's another term that gets thrown around a lot and really and truly it's a poorly defined term. Um, status is a neurologic emergency and that's something that we'll spend some time on in the next slide. Um, but there's also a few other noteworthy kind of generalized grand mal seizure presentations that I wanted to touch on. So we'll get into those and then we'll zoom back out to absent seizures, okay? So when we talk about status, um, there are really two time points that we talk about when we say this person's in status. Um, in the slide above, we just said that most seizures are self-limited and don't have any long-term consequences. In other words, this guy, he's washing the truck, he has a seizure, he falls down, he shakes, he's postictal, he returns to baseline, and life goes on. The first time that, that what we do matters is at the five minute mark. Um, and it's the five minute mark from when the seizure began, not from the time you got there, it's from the time the seizure started. Um, this, is, this is basically the time point when the seizure is unlikely to stop on its own. Um, just to kind of get into it a little bit, if someone has, so for example, in the video we just saw, if he has that giant seizure and then he lays there for three minutes, but he's not, he has no return to baseline and then he starts to convulse again, he never did return to baseline. This, this definition basically says if they never return to baseline, so my son, for example, had a seizure and returned to baseline. If he has another seizure three minutes later, he's not in status. That's just a separate event. Does that distinction make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, someone cannot be shaking for a few minutes, then start shaking again and be in status if they never return to baseline in that time frame. One of the things that we see frequently in the ER is these people come in and they haven't returned to baseline and they're not shaking. Um, and they have sort of a subclinical presentation, like maybe they still have eye deviation where their eyes are still pointed and we, we all go, uh, is he still having a seizure? And that's really the million dollar question is, if they're not obviously having a seizure, are they really having a seizure if they're not back to baseline? Um, so this is one of the things where um, the 30 minute mark then becomes important because at the 30 minute mark, that's when you start to have brain damage. Um, that's when these changes can really affect long term outcome. Um, you can have a scar basically where all these things have happened and if you weren't, if you didn't have epilepsy before, now you will because you have this damage. Um, it's really, really, really difficult to determine based on just physical exam sometimes if a person is in status or not. Um, when I think of status, what I really think of is a, a failure of the body um, and failure, a failure of the mechanism that would otherwise normally inhibit a seizure. In other words, we have a failure of the GABA receptors to do their job, or we have too much of the glutamate that would cause the seizure. There's an imbalance there that the body normally will self-correct within that five minute time frame. Now, when we have five minutes, we say, listen, it is not likely at all that the body is going to do this by itself and we have to intervene. And that's why we say wait five minutes. Um, everyone's heard the term maybe getting snowed. That's when you give somebody too much benzos and they sleep for the next six hours. Um, my son got five of ad five of five of Versed, and then two of Versed, and then four of Ativan within about 30 minutes. And he slept for like the next day. I mean, he was out. Um, that makes it really hard to determine if he's going to come back to his baseline. Like, is he truly at his baseline or is this because of all the medicine we just gave a five year old? You know what I mean? Um, so 
the 30 minute mark is what we care about. That's when we start to see that irreversible damage and um, that's when we really have to step up. Um, there was a study that was published way back in 73. We've known this for a long time that says, hey, irreversible brain damage starts now, even if the subjects are paralyzed and mechanically ventilated. Um, again, disclaimer, I'm not a neurologist, but I think that sounds bad. Um, not every seizure will stop with benzos. Um, no one understands why. It has to do with um, how active the GABA receptors are. Um, what we're understanding now is that the GABA receptors become increasingly resistant to stimulation as the duration of the seizure increases. In other words, um, a seizure that's gone on for 30 minutes is much less likely to be resolved with benzos versus a seizure that's gone on for five minutes. Um, so it's important to dose these people appropriately uh, when we're looking at this. If you underdose them, it's going to make it harder in the future as the seizure continues to get them to come out of that seizure. There are tons of papers that speculate on why this happens and the time frame on which this happens. There's some, pap some papers that say, hey, at the two minute mark, this, act, this seizure activity essentially down regulates these GABA receptors and that's when it starts. Um, I think the most widely kind of reported one says that there's a, a resistance to benzos beginning between 25 to 45 minutes of ongoing seizure activity. Um, in our suburban areas here, we can generally get an EMS crew to you before a 25 minute mark, get an IV started, figure out this is a seizure and get benzos on board. But honestly, that's pushing it. In a rural area, that's really pushing it. You know, if someone has been seizing, if they call 911 and the ambulance is still 20 minutes away and they're still seizing when you get there, you're already behind the eight ball. Um, so that's something that kind of learning more about this stuff when my son got sick, that's something I think I didn't realize. Um, to make matters worse, um, not only is there a down regulation of the GABA receptors, glutamate actually gets upregulated. So there's a higher, there's an increase in the hormone that will cause neuroexcitement. Um, there is a 76% mortality rate if they have status in the elderly population. That's people over 65. Um, part of that is due to the underlying mechanism of whatever's causing the status. So like these people, like maybe they just had a huge infarct, like that's bad. That's going to be a huge factor in their mortality, not necessarily the status part of it. Um, the treatment algorithm that I kind of put up here on the board are shifting towards the use of earlier anesthetics to terminate status. Um, in the United States, we, we spend $4 billion a year with a B, $4 billion a year taking care of patients who are in status. Um, as we're learning, the earlier we can terminate these seizures, the better off these patients are going to be, the better off their outcomes are going to be, the less healthcare dollars we spend. So it wouldn't surprise me to see expanded treatment options in a pre-hospital setting as we learn more about this to terminate these things. Um, so the point here is to recognize the emergency for what it is. This is the seizure emergency. Um, this, you know, this is the give benzos, make sure you're giving enough benzos. Make sure you're giving them at the five minute mark as soon as possible because any time that you delay will make it more difficult to get this person back to their baseline. Hey, Doc. Yes, sir. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but no, we have a backlog of questions if you don't mind. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. That's what I was afraid of. <laughs> I just kept talking. I've got a few myself. <laughs> so um, I'll start with one that seems to, to fit in with what you're talking about, the damage. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question that says, what's causing the damage? Is it ischemia in the brain? No, it's not. So ischemia in the brain is basically an interruption of the blood supply and a, you know interruption of nutrients to the brain. Um, you know, the, the neurons themselves are in a you know, continuously excited state. And if we zoom back into the pathophysiology of this stuff, when we talk about these receptor channels, what we're talking about is we're activating a channel that allows chloride or sodium or potassium that basically allows a charged ion into the cell. Um, it changes the membrane potential of the cell in a good way because that's how we that's how we pass electrical impulses and that's how we do things like move our muscles and breathe. 
But if you continuously have this influx of ions, then you get an imbalance and you can actually cause cellular damage that way. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like um, an absolute refractory period going forward for that neuron. Yeah, kind of. I mean, if you take a cell, right, and you drop it in salt, the cell's not going to do well. Um, you know, there, there are multiple reasons that the cell gets damaged, but if you think about taking a cell and dropping it in salt, you're going to pull all the water out of it, you'll dehydrate it, it won't have the tools that it needs to carry the functions it needs to survive, and that's ultimately what kills it. Dr. Ferg, you got any insight? That's how I think about it. Um, again, I don't, you know, when I'm treating this stuff, I don't zoom in to, you know, a cellular level every single time, but that's, that's how it happens. You get that, you know, it's a cellular damage issue. So we've had a couple of people text and comment. I think this is a probably a not such a rare experience for paramedics that have been working for a while. Mm -hmm. Do you have an older patient? Uh, a lot of times it's a chest pain call or some other call. Mm -hmm. They have a seizure and when the seizure stops, they're in V-fib. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, people just making the point to always check a pulse yeah. after the seizure yeah. stops. And we'll talk, I've got a whole section on seizure mimics that we'll, we'll hit in the end um, because yeah, it, so basically uh, essentially half of, of what are billed as seizures are actually seizures and the other half are something else. Um, that's kind of a rough estimate, but yeah, that's a that's a common thing. There's lots, lots and lots and lots of things that get mistaken for seizure. Um, obviously, someone being in VFib is a critical thing to not miss. <laughs> you don't you don't want to give that person benzos. They need electricity um, and diesel fuel. So um, yeah. So related to that is uh, the old idea or terminology of pseudo seizures. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about that too. Particularly from hyperventilation syndrome. Uh -huh. Yeah, we'll okay. talk about that. I love pseudo seizures. Those are my people. I got, I got one more. Yeah. Yet. I got one more to get go caught up here. Um, with status and baseline, are we calling baseline alert or oriented, or just regaining muscle tone, even though they are confused and baseline? Baseline is going to be the state they were in before they had the seizure. Okay. So not not everyone's baseline is the same. Um, Amen. One of the <laughs> One of the one of the common things that um, I've seen in the past is a patient that has a history of seizures, but they also have an underlying um, neurologic problem. They have like cerebral palsy or they've had a traumatic brain injury. That person's baseline is not the same as my baseline or your baseline. Um, that person's baseline may be very different. And it's it's difficult because it's easy for us to assess what a normal person's baseline should be. Can they answer the appropriate questions and tell me who the president is and what year it is and those things? Some of these people don't have a normal baseline and it becomes more difficult to decide is this normal for them or not, if that makes sense. And that's hard. And you yeah, really have to, you've got to rely a lot on their caretaker who sees them day in and day out. For example, that seizure that Luke had that I showed you all a video of, you know, if you'd never met him before, you would not have walked in the room and been like, that kid's having a seizure. Like, you're going to have to really rely on the people who know that patient more to decide and just take them at face value. You know, that that's my, you know. I think one of the, I think the question is really asking about defining or not defining status. So if we have, if we have somebody who's post-dictal and they're snores respirations and they're completely unresponsive, uh -huh. and then two minutes later they're waking up and looking around, but they can't talk or they don't make sense, and then they have another seizure. Oh, yeah, yeah, so I see what you're saying. Yeah, so I would treat that if they did not come back to where they were and then they seize again, I would I would treat that as status. Okay. Now, if um, if they're showing, you know, the postictal phase can last for various periods of time. It just depends on the individual. If they're continuing to show a positive trend, they are improving and they don't get worse. In other words, you're not concerned that they're having another seizure. They're not actively convulsing and they don't have like weird eye movements, like they're not locked over to one side. Um, but they're like, you know, they'll come back through that phase. They're going to go, uh, you know, and they're going to be responsive to pain. And then they might be responsive to like some verbal stuff and their GCS will get better and better as they kind of head back towards baseline. Um, if they're headed in that direction and it's been 10 minutes and they still haven't seized, I wouldn't call that status. I would just say this is the post phase. There is a, a, a distinction there. If they, you know, are headed in the right direction and then something changes, all of a sudden now they're not 
verbally responsive or they're not responsive to pain anymore. Now I'm more concerned that they're in status. It's really difficult just on a physical exam standpoint. It can be really, really tricky. I, and I know exactly the patients that they're talking about, you know, the medics who have seen this before, it's really hard to do. It's really hard to do. So the, the, the decision point on the scene or during transport, and Dr. Ferguson might speak to this, is when do we give the benzo? So they're post-dictal, they start coming around. Does that person get a benzo? Because I would say no. No, no. So now they have more seizure activity or their, their mentation declines. Now yes. do they get benzo? Now, I would, now I, would, I would err on the side of benzo because like we just said, if you suspect that they're still seizing, I believe you. Hey, look, I was on scene, they had a seizure, and then this weird thing happened. I gave them benzos. That's great because, as we know, it's going to be harder and harder. If you just transport that person and it takes 20 minutes to get to the hospital and they've seized the entire time, we're behind the eight ball again, you know? So, would it hurt anything to go ahead and give them benzo in that? So, you know, in that. All of this is risk benefit stuff. You know, we say normally these things will terminate in five minutes on their own. And we want to give the body an appropriate chance to do that because from a risk benefit standpoint, there are adverse effects with benzos, right? So if my option is to give it or not give it and not giving it is going to avoid all of the adverse effects, I'm just going to let it ride for a few minutes and see if it fixes itself. Once I hit that five minute mark, then it's like, all right, this is not going to stop. We've got to give the benzo now. Um, and that's when you want to hit them pretty hard with it. So the, the other issue yeah. there is, is kind of, uh, to me, logistical or pragmatic. If you go to the ER and you've given them benzos unnecessarily and they're snowed, they're mm -hmm. probably going to get innovated. Yeah, so that's definitely the cards for these people. And that's, <laughs> that's why I've got the picture of the, <laughs> of the guy getting tube up here. It's not uncommon for us to do that. Um, but at the end of the day, so when I was a medic, I felt like intubation was like this big life altering thing. And it was just like a monumental decision. And it's not something that you should take lightly. But at the same time, we'll intubate these people. We can protect their airway. I'm happy. He's intubated. We're ventilating well. I'm a happy guy. No problem. This guy can be snow. This guy can be post -dictal. He can do whatever he wants. I don't care. As long as he's breathing and oxygenating well, I don't care if the machine is doing it. I'm fine with that. Um, I don't mind intubating these people. And then as the benzos wear off, as their postictal phase wears off, they start to become more responsive in the room. We should extubate them. It's not that big a deal. Yeah. I agree completely. So yeah, the, we, we just had an experience with a family member who that happened. Seizure activity, actively seasoned the emissional scene, appropriately got Benzo mm -hmm. was intubated upon arrival, emergency department, and ended up staying on a ventilator for six days because it seemed to be so complicated for the staff to make the decision whether to to take them off the ventilator or not. Yeah, and it, you know I can't speak to that specific situation. Um, you know, these patients who are who who do wind up in status, who if you look at this treatment algorithm, you know. We wind up here in the world of propofol pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, the case sometimes is these, once you try to wean that off, some of these people will not be able to do that. And that's not a reflection at all of how they were treated in the pre hospital or the hospital setting. That's just their underlying, you know, pathology. Um, they just are now in a state of status that we cannot overcome. And, you know, their option is to, and I've seen this personally happen before with people, their option is this person will remain sedated on a vent um, or we can withdraw care. You know, and unfortunately, that's just the end of the road sometimes. Um, we hate that, but we definitely want to get them out of the seizure as early as possible. I don't think that in those cases, um, adding benzos or, you know, getting them out of a seizure earlier, that person had such a significant underlying pathology that it didn't matter what we did, if that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Did, that help? did I help it? Did I answer yours? Okay. Good deal. The risk of giving the benzo is respiratory depression. So if you're giving the benzo for the seizure, which is appropriate, correct, be ready to manage that airway. Correct. If they get hypoxic, they don't just like we talked about post cavity, they don't get just oxygen. You open their airway, nasal trumpet. You O2 and ventilate. So that's the risk of the benzo. And if that happens, it's not a big deal. You can manage your airway. Yeah. yeah. If I can add, 
just the patient postictal. We need to monitor that airway and properly position the patient for you know, just for general secretions or in case exactly. they choose to vomit. You know, it's you know, right. yeah, absolutely, just, absolutely, hundred percent. And it, you know, it does it does become difficult because you wind up in this gray area trying to decide between two things. And one of those things requires an intervention and the other one just requires time. Um, you know, from my personal experience, when my son would have seizures, he would, like I said, he would have a respiratory arrest and he would desat. And we were in a transition period where we were going to a, from a step down unit to an intensive care unit and he had a seizure and he desatted. So by the time the intensivist walked in the room, his sats were in the 50s and we were bagging him. And at this point, this had happened. 10 or 12 times and it's not a big deal. We bag him, we give him a minute, we give him some out of van. He gets better, he breathes on his own. We don't have to worry about it. But this, you know, the intensivist had not met Luke and didn't know, you know, about his, you know, the, his hospital course. And so he walked in the room and saw, we're bagging a five-year-old, sats from the 50s, and he went, give me a time of date and sucks. And I went, whoa, wait, let's just give him some out of van. Let's break the seizure. Let's get him breathing again. And he was like, all right, we'll try it first. <laughs> so, because I was like, I, I, I don't want to, you know, it, the, the, the decision to intubate someone, you know, it shouldn't be taken lightly, but it's, you know, definitely as an advocate for my child, it was something that I was like, no, no, let's do this first, you know, because then I don't want to have to deal with like a vent wean and all these other things. So, fortunately, that, that, that worked for him. Um, but I, I do definitely acutely understand how a difficult of a decision it can be. Any other questions on status before we move on to eclampsia? Cool. All right. Um, I, I think eclampsia deserves a mention because I, I think of it as the other kind of seizure emergency and the treatment is different for this. Um, so eclampsia is preeclampsia plus seizure. Preeclampsia is hypertension plus pregnancy plus proteinuria. Well, that's not something we can test for in the field. And what that means is that there's protein in the urine. That's what we look for in the hospital. So your kidney essentially acts like a colander or a sieve. Um, it's supposed to push, you know, filter through the stuff in the blood. Protein is not supposed to get through those holes. So when we see protein in the urine, we go, this is a problem. Um, blood pressure can be too high. It can be forcing protein through the holes in the sieve. There can be an injury to the kidney itself. Um, we look at that and we say, hmm, this is not normal. There's damage to the kidneys. Something is going on here. Um, and if you notice here, the protocol says edema. So it just says um, history of headache, vision changes, right upper quadrant pain, peripheral edema. And then again, um, it says field diagnosis of preeclampsia based on the findings of pregnancy, hypertension, and edema. Um, the the protein normally circulates in the blood and it's one of the things that dr ferg talked about when we talked about the liver injury that's one of the things the liver does is make proteins that that go into your blood and the purpose of having that is oncotic pressure um, inside the blood vessel so without getting too sciencey um, you have to have those proteins in the blood in order to keep the fluid component of the blood in the blood vessel and prevent it from leaking out into the cell wall, into the tissues that surround the vessels. Um, what happens is when the protein gets excreted through the kidneys, we lose that oncotic pressure and it allows that fluid component then to leak out into the cell walls, into the surrounding tissues, and that's why we see the edema in that case. Does that make sense? Um, there is a consensus agreement now among the obstetricians that essentially edema should no longer be considered as part of the diagnostic criteria for preeclampsia. Um, this is because edema is a common benign finding in pregnancy anyway. Um, so lots of lots of pregnant women will have swollen ankles and not have any damage to their kidneys. This is for a completely different different issue, different you know, they've got a baby that's pressing on their IVC and causes some venous return issues. Um, and there's no way to go, well, this edema is benign and normal, or this edema is because there's kidney damage and they're leaking proteins. There's no way to do that. Um, so it's a normal thing. And a third of women with eclampsia never have edema. Um, 
it's just not a sensitive or a specific enough finding um, to really say, to really call um, on its own. So even if we take that out, these people still have pregnant and hypertension that should still be recognized for the emergency that it is. Pregnant plus hypertension plus seizure or pregnant plus seizure. That's like eclampsia until proven otherwise. Like that person definitely comes to the hospital um, and that carries um, some significant uh, morbidity and mortality for mom and baby. Um, only 10% of people have um, eclampsia or preeclampsia before 34 weeks gestation. Um, however, this can happen anytime during pregnancy. Just know that the bulk of the people that this will happen to, they will be obviously pregnant for the most part. Um, I, I think I remember that the definition when I was a medic was, you know, you can't have preeclampsia. You have to be over 20 weeks. Um, that's a generalization. It's not necessarily true. There are some um, gestational pregnancy issues. There's some things called molar pregnancies that can cause this to happen earlier. Um, all you really need to be aware of is that this can happen at any point. So most of these people will visibly be pregnant. Not all of them will, though. Makes sense. This can also happen up to a month after they deliver. Um, they can still have this happen. Um, the treatment for this uh, is different. It's magnesium. They've got it listed as Cat B, um, so you need to call. Ferg, I don't anticipate not giving orders for this. If you have a pregnant woman seizing, I mean, Mag is a pretty, um, it's a pretty safe drug. Um, you got to monitor the respiratory drive, but it's a, uh, it's not as concerning as it is with like benzos, um, but it's something to be aware of. I don't, can you anticipate any, I, I mean, I, 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 when I wrote this, I tried to think, are there any situations that I would say, no, don't give this person mag. I just couldn't come up with anything good. So again, when you call make control, be quick, tell them what you want yeah. and ask for what you need and we should give it to you and uh -huh. be off the phone quick. I have a pregnant pregnancy. season lady. I'd like to give mag. If they're still seizing, I'd like to give benzos. Just, just, yes, just, yes, uh, yes, it sounds yes, good. Yes, sounds like, yes. I don't know if other agencies are experiencing this, but we've had a few months now where we can't get mag sulfate from the pharmacy that's packaged in a reasonable way like we were used to it's oh really on back order or back order back order so, so uh just be aware that some agencies might not have it good to know um are they carrying different different concentrations of mag or is just is it just off the truck i think the only way i can get it right now is in some ridiculous formulation like a huge bottle with 500 in it or something okay um which doesn't make a lot of sense um so good enough good enough okay so these people will go for emergency sections so the pre-hospital treatment is going to be first line mag if they keep seizing it's going to be benzos when they get to the hospital um first thing i'm going to do is, is call an ob doctor because they need to deliver the baby. That's the solution to all this. Uh, we got to get baby out of there. Um, so this is kind of the other, when I think of like seizure emergencies, the one is the seizure that won't stop, and this is the seizure in the pregnant lady. Um, and this is kind of the third sort of generalized seizure I wanted to touch on just because it's the most common um, seizure in children. It's the febrile seizure. I think anyone who's done EMS for very long at all. Uh, this is definitely, if you haven't done this for very long, if you haven't seen this yet, this is in your future. Uh, you will see this at some point. Um, the kids are usually fine. It's the parents. Um, the parents are freaking out. And understandably, I've been there. I get it. Um, these, these are always coming in by ambulance. Always. Like there's not a parent or caregiver in the world that's like, no, we'll take care of this at home. This comes in hot and you're going to have to fight the parents to stay out of the back of the truck. Um, in order to be called a febrile seizure, it has to meet a few criteria. The kids have to be a certain age, six months to five years. They've got to have obviously a fever to be a febrile seizure and we're defining fever as 100.4. And then this is going to be more of a decide this in the hospital, but they can't have a CNS infection. So if they have um, HSV encephalitis and they have a fever because they have an infection and they have a seizure. The seizure is because the virus is attacking the temporal lobes of their brain, not because they have a fever. Does that make sense? So that's not a distinguishment you get to make in the field. It's just something that we have to learn more about when this person is seizing. 
far and away the most common thing is because they have a fever. So these are classified as simple or complex. Um, the, to, to be called simple, it has to meet all of those things. It has to be less than 15 minutes. They can't look like they have a stroke when it's over. They can't come back and it has to be a generalized thing. It can't be a focal seizure. So this will look like a big generalized seizure. Um, when we say focal neurologic findings, we'll talk a little bit about a specific one uh, called Todd paralysis coming up in a, in a future slide. Um, that would lean more towards um, what, what the question was like, hey, this person had a stroke, but it looked like a seizure kind of thing. That's why this is part of the definition is because you don't want to accuse like an, uh, an ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke with a febrile seizure, if that makes sense. So no focal findings. They have to move their arms. They have to move their legs. They will come back to baseline. To be called complex, any one of those three things can happen. Um, with Luke, our personal experience, that was my hope because he had had a little viral illness earlier in the week. And I thought this is just a febrile seizure. This is great. He didn't even have a fever, but the neurologists were like, eh, well, you know, maybe well, there's a gray area. We can get away with some stuff. Um, we took him to the ER. Um, his lab work was totally normal. His CSF fluid when they did the lumbar puncture was totally normal. His CT scan of his head was totally normal. And so me, knowing what I know, I was like, well, this is great. Like, this is just a random one time we're done seizure. Everything else is normal. He doesn't have a crazy infection. He doesn't have like a big Goomba in his brain somewhere. We get to go home. But then it came back, he had recurrence. And we wound up in a different world. He was not a febrile seizure, but just know that it can't come back within 24 hours. They can't have any neurologic findings and it has to self-resolve after 15 minutes. Um, so the other thing to note, just reassure the parents. The parents are gonna be freaking out. Um, hey, you know, I know you said your kid was sick earlier this week most likely a febrile seizure. Most of these are benign and self-resolved. We're gonna take him in the ambulance. Um, I'm gonna start an IV on him. If he seizes again, I have medicine to make that stop. We're gonna take him to the hospital. When he gets to the hospital, they're gonna do lab work. They may do a lumbar puncture. They may scan his head. Um, you guys will be there for probably the next four to six hours while they get some more answers for you. That gives them an idea of where you're going. And they're like, I don't love this situation, but great. Like that's what we have to work with. They're gonna want all these answers. Why is this happening? And we just don't have that stuff. All right, so back to our kind of big classification slide here. We're gonna back to absence. I realize that it is spelled absence. Um, it is the French pronunciation, um, absence, or you can just use the King's English and call it like it's spelled absence. I don't care. Um, I'll understand what you're talking about either way. Um, and this is a video of, of what it looks like. And I think there was a question earlier about um, hypoxic kind of hypoxia driving seizures. Uh, that's actually what they're doing. They're, they're um, basically increasing uh, or decreasing his carbon dioxide. They're making him a little hypoxic and um, it's going to trigger this absence seizure. If you notice, he doesn't fall over. He doesn't have these giant contractions. He just kind of stares off into space. Um, they're unique. These are not something you're likely to see in like the pre-hospital setting. People aren't likely to call an ambulance for this. Um, most of the time, these get um, brought into like a pediatrician's office because the child gets in trouble at school, the child's grade starts going down. Um, they sometimes get misdiagnosed with having like ADHD because of this. Um, they cause brief momentary lapses in consciousness. There is no muscle change and there is no postictal phase, but it is a generalized diffuse firing of the entire cortex of the brain. Um, these kids look just like this. They look like they just stare off into space. Um, they glaze over and then they come right back. From the kid's perspective, like they sit in a classroom and they, they're watching the teacher and the teacher will be drawn on the blackboard. And then next thing they know, the teacher's over here. And then the next thing they know, the teacher's in their face and yelling at them, and they have no idea. Like, they, they have no idea what's going on. And then they're like in the hall, you know, they have no idea. Um, 
they have to be diagnosed by observing a really specific pattern on that EEG. Um, it's a three hertz spike and wave pattern. Um, and once we see that pattern, it's like automatic, like, yes, this is an absent seizure. And they get treated with a special drug called ethosuximide. Um, it's a little bit different. This is not something you would typically have to give benzos or anything like that to in the field um, because this lasts less than five minutes and they return completely to baseline before it happens again. Make sense? Is it more common in children? Yes, yeah, prevalent in children, very uncommon in anything other than children. This is mostly a school age children thing. I hesitate to say all the time because medicine is, is a liar. Yeah. <laughs> As soon as I say that, I'll go to work and there'll be a 70 year old having absence seizures or something. Um, how are we doing on time? Do we need to stop and break or anything? Yeah, we've we got about a minute or two to kind of finish up. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, so I'll kind of blaze through the rest of this then. Um, these are just key points that'll help guide you because it's difficult when you're trying to decide if someone had a seizure or not. Um, are they pregnant? alcohol or drug use, that's the most common stuff. A history of seizures and I've been drinking, a history of seizures and I quit taking my medicine. Um, a history of seizures and immunosuppression, that gets into the scary world of like uh, CNS infections. Um, and that's why that's up there. Uh, physical exam, um, there's not a single physical exam finding that can confirm or rule out a seizure, um, but there are things that support it. The most sensitive, physical exam finding, and I wasn't aware of this when I was a medic, is lateral tongue while biting. Um, so if there's a question, I think this person may have had a seizure, have them stick their tongue out or pull their tongue out, take a look. Um, if they have bit the side of it, that's a, a, a good prognostic indicator that, that the person did have a seizure. Um, I was always taught, you know, incontinence, um, contrary to Billy Madison, not everyone pees their pants when they have a seizure. Um, Kind of a unique thing, I put this in just for Matt Campbell because he loves scrubs, um, is Todd paralysis, which um, is essentially a seizure pretending to be a stroke. Um, we, this person will have a seizure, have a post phase, and then have a neuro deficit. They'll have like facial droop and arm weakness, and it looks just like a stroke. And there's no way to say this isn't a stroke. And so you treat it like you would treat any other stroke. There's a potential for you to be called, person with a seizure, history of seizures. When you get there, seizures resolve, but now has left-sided deficits. You still have to treat that like a stroke. Um, interestingly enough, we'll, we'll treat it like a stroke when you bring them to the ER. We get worried about that. And then they'll have a clean CT and neuro goes, oh, this is probably Todd paralysis. And they completely self-resolve in about, the average is 15 hours, the longest is about one and a half days. Um, but they act like they have a stroke and then they don't. Um, seizure mimics were what we were talking about. These are common, like we said, about half of all seizures um, are not really seizures. Um, it's something else that happens that looks like a seizure. Syncope is the most common. Um, that syncope, that syncopal event could be because the person was in V-fib and they were fine, they went V-fib and then they collapsed and had some jerking motions and someone thought, oh, that's a seizure and you get there and they're actually in cardiac arrest. Um, Stroke, TIA, same situation. The stroke itself can actually cause a seizure, um, but the stroke can look like a seizure as well. Um, it can even be a small stroke. It can mimic a lot of like the um, simple partial seizures sometimes. Um, you can just have like an isolated deficit um, that can be mistaken for like a simple type thing. Sleep disorders like narcolepsy um, or the uh, hypnic jerks. So like if you're laying next to your boo, and they jerk, you know, that's not a seizure. That's just your boo going to sleep. Um, my <laughs> migraines can have an aura. Some seizures can have an aura. There can also be some neuro deficits associated with migraines. Uh, my favorite, the psychogenic non-epileptic seizures is the politically correct term for uh, what we call, what, what we talked about earlier, this, this essentially this conversion disorder. This is a subset of conversion disorder. Um, this person is not having a seizure. Um, I'll skip to that slide. The fainting goats, that's syncope. I always feel bad for the goats. You know what, they, so people would think these are like a parlor trick, but they actually, um, the purpose of these was they would put these goats with more expensive livestock. And then if something attacked the livestock, the goat would faint and whatever was attacking would eat the cheap fainting goat and the expensive <laughs> stuff would. Lamb. It's exactly what it is. It's a sacrificial lamb, you know? 
goat. Except, yeah, it's a sacrificial goat. Um, so, you know, a lot of times in EMS, we get on scene and we're like, I'm not sure. Like your spidey sense is going off. You're going, I'm not sure this is an actual seizure. These are a few of the clues that, that you can use. Asynchronous extremity movements. Like they're doing the wave, like this right here. If you if you zoom back to that video when that gentleman was on the ground, he was shaking. It was all rhythmic and bilateral. Um, if these people are flopping around like a fish, um, eh, there's probably something what we call super tentorial going on. Um, probably not not working. If they're shaking their head like they're saying no, nah, that's gonna that's that triggers the spidey sense. Pelvic thrusting is interesting because I've seen that happen before. Um, they'll curl up in the fetal position and they'll just do this, you know, and that's all it is. And someone's like, oh, yeah, they're having a seizure. And you're like, eh, no, that's not a seizure. Um, this is the most specific thing is if their eyes are closed during the event. Um, so most of the time their eyes are wide open and their pupils are dilated and it's really hard to fake that. Um, if they have an immediate recall of the event, if they're actively crying during the event, these should all be things that raise your spidey sense. This is also a diagnosis of exclusion. This was something that frustrated me to no end, but also gave me great joy taking care of these people in EMS because they would always call it like two in the morning. Um, and there was always some dramatic, you know, thing. These people have like 40% of them have underlying epilepsy so it can be difficult because you'll get there they'll be flopping around you go that doesn't look like a seizure and some family member goes oh no they have a history of seizures and they take these medicines and you're like it makes it a little more difficult now um 60 of these people will also have um an underlying psych disorder um this is mostly in women this has been described in medical literature for hundreds of years it was called a uh, wandering uterus for a while, that was the medical name for it because it was so prevalent in women. They thought that the uterus would travel and inhabit other organs, and that's what would cause the symptoms. And then men started having it, and they were like, no, this is ghosts. Just kidding. Um, so hospital management, um, this is the stuff that we're gonna do in the hospital here. This is the EEG when it's on. Uh, another picture of Luke here. Um, we're going to get labs. We're going to make sure they're not pregnant. We're going to see if they have alcohol on board. We're going to check therapeutic drug levels. Uh, plus or minus imaging. Not everyone gets imaged. Um, some people need lots of imaging. Some people don't. For us in the hospital, just the same as in the pre-hospital setting, our first line treatment is benzos. And then we're going to upgrade to Keppra. Um, I prefer phosphinitoin after that. Um, and then we're talking about sedatum and intubatum. Key takeaways here. Um, lots of things. That, again, this is something we could talk about for hours and hours. I'm sorry I went a little bit long. Um, it's the family when we're not in the hospital with seizures. These are all the references. Any other questions up there? Of course. Do you mind flipping all the way back to the slide? And I don't have a question. I just want to look at it. the slide where um, that um, why the brain releases those GABAs. It was a there was a list. It's early on in the. And as we go back, I just want to say. A good point was brought up earlier about the V-fib. So there was a case last week. Patient chest pain went to the rescue, sat down. They're getting the 12 lead. Patient had a seizure. They administered Versed, kind of back of the monitor and they're in V-fib. So remember, people can have seizure like activities from cardiac arrest. So think about the things that kill people. Check a pulse, check a glucose, make sure they're not hypoxic. Did you make up that slide, sir? In your brain? I didn't see it. Uh, no, no. It's yeah, right. said, this, it said alcohol, such and such, such and such. Uh, that's, this is the one where I talked about alcohol and all the different, different factors. Uh, Dr. Farr brings a really good point, hypoglycemia. Um, can do this, and that's why the treatment protocol, you know, it's, you know, IVO2 monitor, BG. Um, yeah, please don't. It's embarrassing if you bring a seizing patient into the hospital with a blood blood sugar of 12. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to do that. No. Yeah. 
It's bad for the patient, bad for you, bad for everybody. That's bad. So, cool. Yeah, so I've heard uh, for years and years, and I, I don't know if this is worth even bringing up, that hypoglycemia can cause seizures, but hyperglycemia, not so much. Um, uh, yeah, I think generally that's true. I'm hesitant to, to give you a definitive yes or no for anything in medicine after yeah. doing this for a little while. Um, they go, oh, this can't possibly happen, and then it definitely happens. Right. Um, I think it's more common that hypo cause someone to have a seizure, <laughs> right? And if they seize and they're hyperglycemic, you can't fix it in the field, and you right you have no, no insulin, nothing like that. Uh, you're more likely to see them become acidotic, DKA, and then seize because they're acidotic, be my guess. But if a hypoglycemic and seize and we don't find it, somebody can die from that. So your basics go a long way. Airway management, your glucose, if they seize and then we're having chest pain before they seize, check a pulse before you grab the set, make sure they have a pulse. If not, get them with that monitor and take care of that. There are a lot of seizure mimics out there, but this is an excellent topic. Yeah, this, this is something that we could talk for hours about. So. Yeah, I know one thing that's come up a uh, long time ago was had a patient with severe head trauma that uh, was posturing and was briefly mistaken for seizure activity. And then they had a trend loss seizure. And then the question becomes, okay, do we give benzos to this critical trauma patient because they're seizing or not? And um, anyway, we did give them the benzos, but I think that's uh, reasonable. But you still manage the airway, give the benzos, keep moving to defending care. Absolutely. Did we ever ask any questions out there? No, I think we covered them all. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, it was a great presentation, Doc. We really appreciate you being here. Come back anytime. Dr. Ferguson, great lecture as always. <coughs> Excuse me. Everybody, please remember uh, to fill out an attendance form uh, for today. Even if you don't need the con ed, it really helps us to measure our participation to get everybody to, uh, to sign in. The password on the attendance form for today's class is 2021-2021. We'll be coming to you two weeks from today uh, from Foley, Alabama. If you live down in South Alabama and you're listening today, please uh, make plans to attend. At that session, we'll have a skills lab in the afternoon following the lecture in the morning. So thanks everybody for being here and we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.